or Fallout, the classic original movie, episodes 7 through 12, by the one and only Percy and the Beast production. This video is long overdue because I did react to the first half, which was episodes 6 through 12, and then I couldn't find this other half because it was like lost in the playlist. As we see here, it was listed as unlisted. So it was nightmares trying to find this. I was going insane. And before we begin with this video, I want to give a shout out to Eddie Munson. He is on day 10 for trying to get a shout out. So here you go, man. Here's your shout out. Let's begin. I always get like, it feels like nostalgia sorta of, when I see this intro. <laughs> oh, the duck. The duck was shaking, bro, all crazy. Okay, I think that's like a little recap of what we're gonna see in this. Percy and the Beast Productions presents. Sort of Fallout, Fallout originally by, oh yeah, Tiz, shout out to the Timothy Thunderbolt. Oh yeah, make sure to grab some snacks because this is around 30 minutes. That thing is in reverse. What's the dog doing? Uh oh. Is that the beast? Dude, his face. They give me nightmares. Okay, his eyes are freaking me out. They're like so big. That coffee freak. Dude. Poor duck. So scared his eyes are bouncing. Oh! It's a warning, bro. It doesn't sound too pretty. I repeat the duck. He went out. A true hero. As we traveled down the line, we decided to check the kill day nail works just to look for survivors. Sadly, no see. one was there. The only thing which remained was the hollowed out corpse of another engine whose shape was all too familiar. There was only one great western panic tank on the island, and we knew we had lost Duck. He had no eyes and a gaping hole in his forehead. Just the sight of him made me want to vomit. Several pieces had been ripped off of him. He was missing a side road and a few sections of handrails. To add to that, it seemed as if the whole engine was completely hollow. Boiler tubes, water tanks, and bunker all empty. Even the ashes at the bottom of his firebox were gone. And he stripped them down, bro, like to scratch. Nothing with nothing. We decided to leave, and while doing so, we spotted Ari and Brett the Ironworks twins. They were empty shells, tossed aside off the line. They didn't stick around for long.
We went down Kilding Line and we couldn't believe what we saw. Henry and a bunch of workmen from Brendan were safe as can be in a good shed. Henry was overjoyed to see Edward, but seemed to be a bit focused on something else. <laughs> His eyes. Overload on happiness. They talked about the things they saw and how thankful they were to have survived. I asked Paul how Henry wasn't mutated. The reason he survived and hasn't been affected by the radiation was because of his special coal. The hopper he used the day prior was his old special Welsh coal, and he had to take a few coal trucks as well as fish during his usual weekly kipper run, and thankfully, he used it to keep him alive through the last couple of days. Got that good stuff, huh? So happy together. Oh. We then noticed how many people were in the sheds. I counted around 23 people, excluding Edward and Henry. We've decided to stick together and spend the night with them. All right, so he reunited with the friend. This Gordon? They used to run down the line to see if they can find anyone who needs help, but stopped two days ago when they tried to make their way to the ironworks. An engine was blocking their path, and when Henry was about to confront it, the engine charged at them and started to make them set with that? loud roars. Oh. Henry was frightened and charged back down the line and back to Kilding. <coughs> Is that Jamis? No, right? I forgot. Apparently, several engines have passed by here recently. Henry had noticed Percy passed by that morning. He had no intent of stopping and was assumed to be going the direction of the Vicar Stown Bridge. Right, that boy was zooming, man. The night before Percy passed by, Gordon shot past. He didn't say anything, but all Henry could hear was him trying to scream. Guy is mutating. The radiation, man. He heard that and he didn't think of let me help him. Like, let's, let's see what's up with my boy. Nothing, bro. That's messed up. We exchanged stories of the fallout until we grew tired and eventually fell asleep. Paul also told us that he had nicknamed Henry the Night Walker, but we preferred just calling him Henry. We said goodnight, mm, closed boy. eyes, and fell soundly to sleep. I like that nickname, the Night Walker. Frederick last night, damn engine went after the poor guy. He thought he was a safe distance away from the tracks. Boy, was he wrong. Some workmen found his body in an old shed this morning after hearing him scream in pain. Dang, everybody getting killed, bro, left and right. Nobody safe out here, man. Nobody safe. It's been 15 minutes since we've departed from Kilden. We're keeping the fires as low as possible so no attention could be drawn to us so far. We haven't seen anything living, only the fog rolling in and the swaying corpses of the dead trees. It's freakishly eerie. Yeah, it does look pretty terrifying. <laughs> like, nah, bro, turn the train around. While 
heading away from Kilmin, we spotted what looked like to be a train off the line. Upon closer inspection, it was actually Percy, who was derailed in a ditch. Both Henry and Edward were in shock when they saw him. He was breathing, but his braids were extremely weak, and his jaw was broken and dislocated. Blood was dripping out of his mouth. I couldn't look at it. I felt like I was going to be sick. Damn, bro. No one could bring themselves to put him out of his misery, so we decided to leave him there. We pulled Annie Clarabelle Scruffy back to the Kildane Yard. We didn't dare look back because we'd only feel more guilty for leaving Percy. Poor Percy, man. That must have hurt. Imagine busting your jaw like the amount of pain. I don't even want to picture that, bro. We've decided to play it safe and think of a strategy. Scruffy then started thinking about a battle plan. I'm running out of space to write, so I'll explain it later. Wonder what it could be. Change of plans, Ruffia's break problems. This might be a problem for the plan we are making. We were planning to use him as bait for a lever, but because we're not able to move him, our plan might not work out. We also heard cries for help in the smelters. We have to investigate soon, or else we might lose more engines and men. Oh, I wonder what's gonna be at the smelters. Sue after Scholar's driver called me on my two-way radio and told me the depressing story of what happened to the narrow gauge number one. Boy, you good? Bro is radiated out. up abruptly by the sound of people arguing it seems like someone took scruffy while we were sleeping last night i'm what? shocked no one heard an engine come by considering paul and garrett are supposed to be keeping us alerted for any upcoming engines but paul and garrett have gone missing too everybody missing man there's a boogeyman out there snatching everybody up We've decided to try and trek back up to Tidmouth. We completely ignored the people and engines there, so it would be best to at least look for more survivors. Hopefully, we won't be... We found a survivor. It was Leonard. He wasn't feeling good. He stayed home on the 4th. If he didn't, who knows what would have happened to him. Me and Edward were very happy to see him again. Upon arriving at Tidmouth Sheds, Leonard fainted at the sight that awaited us. We never expected to find Thomas at Tidmouth Sheds. My he was horribly Thomas. mutated and extremely sad, but despite those attributes, he was almost the same engine we knew and loved. What was most unusual was the fact that the turntable had been cleared of all the trucks that had jammed it, as Felix described previously while we were at Knapford a few days ago. Maybe someone pulled them out. Thomas didn't want to talk much, but despite that, he still told us about what happened to him during the blast. Apparently, Thomas was shunting trucks at Knapford Station when the blast occurred. 
know. Dude, it's so sad seeing Thomas like that. That was all Thomas could remember. We all felt very bad for him after all the pain and suffering he had to endure. After Leonard gained consciousness, he marveled at the sight in front of him. After a bit of discussion with Thomas, he decided to stay with him until we returned up the line. We were planning to only head up to the junction and back, since that's a fairly high traffic area. We parted ways and headed down the line. He goes. What a day for surprise. We found a long oh, Toby, Toby waiting longsomely at Tidmouth Station. He was near some empty coaches which seemed to have been evacuated. He seemed scared and was mumbling to himself repeatedly. We tried to approach him, but kept reversing maybe this whole thing has taken a toll. I dislike this I wouldn't be surprised. Because Toby. We examined the coaches, which were the red and cream fast passenger service ones that James was pulling earlier. Did he leave half his train behind? I don't recall seeing a brake coach on his train, so it must have been the case. It also explains why there was so much luggage loose on the platform. We've decided to raid the station to see if any food was being stored in the offices. We found a few pastries inside of the station, but they were pretty stale. Either way, they tasted pretty good. Some snackies to survive, you know? We got a snack to survive. Everything just happened at once. My hand is shaking right now, and I'm barely able to write. We wanted to ask Toby what happened to him when the blast happened. He seemed petrified, but also on the verge of tears. Dude, my man is going through it, man. Like, just look at his face. While James had just finished shunting his coach together for his next train, Toby was traveling down the line to collect Henrietta from Crovens Gate Works who was getting her windows replaced on a new coat of paint. He soon stopped at a signal at Tidmouth and talked to James, who was complaining about how he had to shunt his own coaches. Man, James, chill out, brother. Gotta be mad, then the bro. the sirens blared loud and long, and the sight of the explosion lit up the sky and caused the earth to ring. James and Toby were petrified urged people to get into the coach. However, only at the train was coupled up and there was no time to grab the shunter's pole and hook them together. Toby then realized that Henrietta would be endangered and might be affected by the blast. James yelled at him to push the brake coach and two others up the line with him to protect the passengers. Toby didn't listen. The brown box led towards the works. James furiously pulled the coaches out of the station as fast as possible while leaving three behind in the process, while the determined tram engine headed straight towards the direction of the blast. 
As the shockwave hit the station, some of the stranded passengers ran for the hills. Others stayed in the station. They've all left by now, but it explains why the interiors of the offices are completely trash. Damn, it was everyone for themselves pretty much in there. Toby proceeded to cry, saying how he was sorry and how he just wanted Henrietta to be safe. Honestly, I was just glad he was safe. I learned that wood isn't affected by radiation, so it made logical sense that he was fine. Then a voice called out from inside of him out of the blue, in a deep groggy voice, which said something like, It's all your fault, Toby. You were greedy and made them suffer. We peeked inside, and what we saw was horrifying. Toby's smoke box had become sentient, a mangled face which resembled one of a troublesome truck with heat burns mostly on the right side of its face was located right behind where Toby's face would be. That was when it hit me. He wasn't mumbling to himself earlier. He was talking to the voice inside his head. Dude, that is crazy. So he mutated from the inside, but not from the up. After waiting around for a bit longer, Crazy. we decided to head on back down the line. We did not want to risk Toby or Firefish getting injured, so Edward and I conceded what you're doing the there, to pull him down the line. What you doing there, Edward? A little sus, my boy. As we traveled on, Toby was breaking down more and more. Edward, being the wise sage he was, used his kind words to calm Toby down and reminded him that they would find Henrietta. I felt a sudden jerk as Edward applied his brakes. We peered out from the side of his cab and saw Thomas steaming idly in front of us with his signature triumphant smirk. Leon had stuck his head out of the cab, saying how good of a job he did for driving his first steam engine. We heard Thomas at the cab door open. As the mysterious figure leaned out of the cab door, he was rather rotund, really quite round, but we didn't see him like that to us. He seemed to be a shining light in a deep dark pit. So Bertram Topham hat. <laughs> what? Where did he even come from, bro? He's just chilling inside the cabin. <laughs> what? <laughs> We decided to go back to Tidmouth Sheds, since we needed a place to rest for the night, as well as a place where Topham can tell us what the heck is going on. We still remained the goal of protecting Toby and Fireface, so Thomas was coupled up to the back of Toby. These story episodes seem way more different from when I actually watched them around the first time as single episodes. Which is, I think, the whole purpose of this classical Lucky, original movie. we arrived at Tidmouth Shed safely, and Toby, Edward, and Thomas were tucked away in the shed. We took some wood we found and made a bonfire outside, and the four of us gathered around it as Topham explained the answers to all the questions we'd been asking for a while. Bold. Shiny. Shiny bald head. He was at Tidmouth Station when the power plant exploded and was waiting patiently in his office for James's train to arrive. He headed out of his office at the sound of an engine's whistle, just in time to see James and Toby arrive. As he prepared to board the passenger train, he heard sirens in the distance followed by a huge blast. He covered his ears tightly as the passengers crowded into James's coaches. After Toby went to retrieve Henrietta, James departed, leaving half of his coaches behind at the platform. With nowhere to run, Topham prepared for the worst. His top hat was blown off of his head before he dropped to the ground, followed by a shell of shattered glass. Luckily, Topham was for the most part unharmed by the falling glass, but the other passengers weren't so lucky. He got up, grabbed his head back, his vision blurry, ears ringing, heart racing, and he started to look around. He noticed a passenger bleeding heavily from his face, and the controller panicked and ran to the parking lot beside the station where his car was located. 
He entered his car, and he sped off in the direction of Tidmouth Sheds. All he was thinking about was the well-being of his beloved engines. He had to find out what or who had caused this, and where his engines were located. The road was rough, probably from the subway. It wasn't long before Sir Topham had hit a pothole. The car seemed stuck, so he got out Bruh. and had a look at it, and noticed the tire was flat. Change the tire, bro. He was frustrated and worried at the same time. He wished that he hadn't left his spare tire at home. At this moment, he had no choice but to walk to a nearby workman's hut. It was constructed not so long ago. It took him a little while to get there, but he was happy to see it. He found food, water, a bed, and a flashlight. So Topham decided to spend the next three days in the hut while he was thinking and planning his next move. He made the decision to leave on the morning of July 7th. Topham started his trek towards Tidmouth Sheds. It was a bit of a walk without his car. As he was walking, he could see Tidmouth Sheds come into view. As he arrived, he could hear strange moaning and groaning, along with the saddened cries of an engine coming from the sheds. He also noticed some mutated trucks jammed into the turntable as That's he walked crazy. past. He was shocked to see what had happened to Thomas. <gasps> Topham took a moment and comforted the poor tank engine and told him he could help him. He spent the night in Thomas's cab as Topham cuddled up in Thomas. They talked for hours about their experiences during the fallout until they fell asleep. The morning was quick to arrive as Topham woke up really early as the sun started to rise. He got to work removing the mutated trucks from the turntable. Afterwards, he came back to Thomas. Topham then released Thomas's brakes and rolled him over to the water tower. After he heard the sound of an engine coming, Happy he Thomas. the shed until the coast was clear. The engine he heard approached was Thomas. Edward, and he only found this out after Leonard spotted him near the sheds. My god, Edward really looks scary. Topham then declared that he knew that this wasn't any ordinary accident. There was someone behind this, and he had a hunch on who it was. He didn't tell us, but did mention he had a spot he passed with them. Whoever it could have been, they really wanted to ruin everything that he loved on this island as we had our small bonfire. I could hear Thomas and Edward discussing who it could have been. Thomas said it could be Diesel, but Edward told him that Diesel was sent back to the mainland years ago. It was nice seeing someone Edward could talk to again. We've decided to get some sleep early, since we were going to try to meet back up with Henry and the others the next day. Despite everyone's chatty mood, Toby was silent, Poor looking Toby. extremely tense. Dude is fighting the demon in his head, bro, literally. What had happened in the span of an hour, it's insane. He woke up to Toby having an episode with Fireface, and he sounded like he was fighting for control. He was begging for it to stop and was able to roll himself back and forth, like someone pacing in circles while in deep thought. Something was going to happen, and I woke up the others. We stood back as Toby screamed in pain, his bell ringing continuously. He was at his breaking point. The voice inside of him were telling him to end it, that he was just a pile of wood ready to rot. Leonard lit Thomas as fire, and Thomas slowly puffed towards him. Thomas oh, asked him what comes. was wrong, but all Toby told him was to take care of Henrietta for him, and then it happened. Topham knew what was going to happen and sprinted towards the tram engine that had taken him out on his holiday trip all those years ago, but it was too late. Topham, Sydney, Leonard and I watched in horror as the tram engine rolled back and dashed down the line as fast as he could, slamming his wooden body into the arm of the breakdown crane. Here it comes! It struck straight into the middle of his face and the sound of splintering wood and flesh was heard as the tram engine fell apart. The arm struck fire fist too and the hook snagged his face and killed it on impact. It was one of the most gruesome scenes I've ever witnessed. <laughs> Topham Come fell on, to Toby. his knees and broke down crying in front of the collapse shell of his beloved number seven. <laughs> Oh, 
how happy he was. It was a happy train. Crazy eyes. You will be missed, Toby. Number seven. We tried to consolidate him, but he did something none of us expected. He got up and said, Toby, you will be remembered as the great engine you were, and you will live on in our hearts forever. This can never be allowed to happen again. We will find out who has done this to our beloved engines, and we will be bring them to justice. I promise you, Toby, your death will not be for nothing. It was a final send-off to a favorite tram before we had to go. Must have been tough on all of them, bro. Imagine seeing that. Like your friend. That's crazy. All right. Thank you for watching the opposite episode. Your support makes these episodes possible. Thank you again for supporting us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, there you have it. The classic original movie by the one and only Percy in the Beast Productions. Make sure to go check out his channel and shout out to Percy for his awesome work. Like always, he always outdoes himself every time. I'll leave the link to the original video down below if you want to check it out for yourselves without my commentary. And yeah, thank you all for watching and have an amazing rest of your Friday. Peace.